welcome here to a very special broadcast of Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora from inside of the Cafe Kubal Studios. It is my honor and privilege to be with you on the East Coast, the Midwest, the West Coast, and all around the globe on wakeupcalldt.podbean.com for internet streaming radio and for video on youtube.com and facebook.com, both backslash wakeupcalldt. It is also an honor for me to have the opportunity to welcome back to the show, Lisa Campos. She's been on the show multiple times and the vice president for intercollegiate athletics at UTSA, say it with me, America, UTSA, the University of Texas, San Antonio, and one of my favorite logos on the planet, the Roadrunners. Why? Because as a kid, and I've never told anybody this until now, so might as well say it. I used to watch Looney Tunes and I was a massive fan of the Roadrunner and loved the fact that he always found a way to get away from the Wiley Coyote. So big fan of the Roadrunner from back, back in the day. And now look at me as an adult getting to talk to a Roadrunner herself, Lisa Campos. Lisa, how are you? Hey, thanks so much for having me. Meep, meep. You remember those days? <laughs> yes. I love that where he, where he put the dynamite in and he'd like, like the Roadrunner would go into the cave. He'd throw the dynamite, light the match, and he'd just sit there and wait. It would blow up. And he's thinking, oh, I'm going to find him in there. And he goes into the cave. And all of a sudden, the Roadrunner leans into him and goes, beep, beep. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. I live for those cartoons. That's good stuff. So that is good stuff. Life of a Roadrunner, there's been a lot of things going on. And there has been a true kind of Roadrunner race here of being in Conference USA, preparing for the American Athletic. And for those that are thinking, oh, that's July 1st, plenty of time away. You have to prepare for this thing very, very early on, and there are so many checks and balances. So I'd love to start with what this final season of competition for all of your athletics has been like inside of Conference USA. Yeah, you know what? We've had such an amazing season in almost all of our sports. And, you know, if you look up the Red Road Runners, we are fierce Um and that that's been our mentality. And, and it's been so much fun starting in the fall season with football and women's soccer earning conference championships, soccer, women's soccer. That was the first CUSA championship we had ever won. And then you follow that into the winter and, and, and the fall and the, the things that our sports are doing. You got baseball, who's cracked top 25 for the first time in program history. You have men's tennis, who was um, as high as ranked as 34th in the nation. Yeah, I think we're our our triple jumper in in uh, outdoors is number one in the nation right now. You got women's basketball who made a, a tremendous uh, improvement this year and, you know, furthest in the conference championship and the list can go on and on. And so we've been really wanting to finish out um, strong in conference USA. But as you mentioned, in the meantime, we've also had a multitask and and think about the transition to the American, which doesn't just happen overnight. We've been really thinking and planning about that since we were invited last, well, two Octobers ago now. Yeah, you know, and and that was, I think we might have talked about it, but maybe we didn't. It it was very poetic because I have covered the Americans since before they had a name or a logo. And I will never forget the day that Mike Oresco, the commissioner, and I were in Rhode Island and he was walking with me. We had just done an interview and I put my arm around him and I said, from one headed, one, from one redheaded stepchild to the next, we're going to build this thing together. And I had just started my company which turns 11 years old this July. And here is the American going into their decade. So we started around the same time. And, and at that time, uh, like, like you were talking about coming into the American and everything that has been, what, what it is today and what has become of it has been such a, a tribute to hard work, dedication, and determination. And to be a part of that and the poetic going back in time the day that you were announced that you would be joining the american just so happened to be my birthday on october 20th <laughs> it all comes full circle <laughs> all full circle here <laughs> so so you know i i kind of sent them like chuck sullivan and mike and all of them and i sent them a message like that you know i appreciate it thanks for the birthday gift i'm happy that you guys did it that you waited for my day but it was kind of a, a running joke. And so, you know, ADs and and different uh, people around the country connected to the American have been like, well, Dan, you know, we did it for you. We wrote it on the calendar. We were waiting. So 
when you look back upon that, look back at October 21st, as we get, you know, ready toward this July 1st, almost two years ago, hard to believe, what have the last two years been like? Yeah, it is hard to believe. And, um, you know, again, I think when we had been preparing, we always know that conference realignment is inevitable. So how do you best position yourself? And during that time, we were having and continue to have such, such success in football. We had just built this beautiful building that I'm in. We're about to cut the ribbon to a new park field, uh, field house for Park West Field House, excuse me, for soccer and men's and women's track and field. We're currently fundraising for a basketball and volleyball practice facility. So we haven't stopped. We haven't stopped at all. And um, and then you factor in again the the transition into the American and and learning about what is their ethos and expectations and culture and and how do we fit into that. And we talk about we don't want to just be in the American. We want to be competitive in the American. And when you go back to you know the youth of of the conference, you look at UTSA. We are only going to start our thirteenth season in football. Yeah. And to have won back to back conference championships, to have gone back to back bowl game, back to back to back bowl games. Um, Jeff's just really turned this thing around. But we're young. We're young as an institution. We're young as an athletics program, and we're certainly young as, as a football program. So what does that mean? We get to create tradition. Um, we've been in multiple conferences. This is you know another step forward. And what's really fun is that we get a we get to really put our footprint on what UTSA athletics is going to be and what we're going to look like in the American. You know, like you said, this, this young history that you've had uh, the in 20, 2012 uh, being in the WAC, then conference USA now going into the American it, this is a very, very young football program. I mean, we're, we're not even talking about two decades. We're talking about a little bit over one how insane is that for you to be overseeing as a VP for intercollegiate athletics at UTSA that this, I mean, this is the baby of division one. A. I I mean, this, it's so unique to be overseeing a football program that is literally making its history, just starting to have a few classes of alumni and the base is very young you don't have someone that played 70 years ago. So what's that been like? Yeah, you know, I don't think I fully appreciated it when I first got here to UTSA, uh, just because I'd always been at schools where, um, you know, we had a lot of tradition. And But the more success we've had, the more I think I've been able to reflect about this is really amazing that in such a short amount of time, um, you know, that we've been able to, to have such success. And I always credit, you know, the previous administration, um, the community, that someone had a vision for UTSA, not just for UTSA athletics, but for UTSA to have um, football here and to create and develop a football program here. And a ton of credit to this community in San Antonio who believed in that vision and who put resources to that vision. And here it is. And now we got to capitalize on that. And we've certainly been doing that with Jeff, but it, it's been fun, you know, just creating our own traditions and, um, and then speaking to our fans, you know, some of our fan base, they were, um, they didn't grow up coming to UTSA football games. You know, they didn't start coming until they were in high school or some of them while they were in college that um, we don't have that deep um, fan base because we're only 13 years old, but but it's a lot of fun. And the more, like I said, that I reflect, it, it is really something special. Yeah, when we look from, you know, in the last decade's time too, I mean, we four bowl games, so almost 50% of the time, of this program from 2012 to 2022 has been to a bowl game has to say something and three and all three seasons for Jeff there there's something to be stated about the fact that there's teams that struggle to make bowl games don't make them for over a decade and here's this program doing it four times in you know, almost 50 percent of the time overall from 2012 to now right and and what's even more amazing I think is that the trajectory um, of this program with Jeff's hiring happened all during the start of 2020. <laughs> and we all know what happened in 2020 was COVID and how we've come out of that, how we acted during that. I mean, we built this building during COVID. It broke ground March of 2020. We kept building, we got it done. We hired Jeff in December of 2019. He started building the program in that spring season when things shut down. He was able to, you know, we were able to play football in the fall that we've done this um, during a really, really difficult time. And we're just coming out on top. 
And, and what is it about Jeff Trailer? I mean, you came in to UTSA back in 2017. What about him? I know we've spoken about him before, but now that you've had some few a few years to reflect on it, why was he the right person to lead this program? And why does he continue to be the right person? Because you don't just stumble upon a coach that goes to three bowl games in three seasons. That's right. Um, you know, hiring coaches, there's a lot of research, but there is a little bit of luck that goes into it. And I think I've, I've shared the story that when we were interviewing for that position, um, everyone kept bringing up Jeff Trailer, and, and he wasn't on our radar. And, and luckily, we were able to, to get him in front of me and the president. And I'll tell you, the, the hook was that Jeff and I are aligned in this is about 18 to 22 year olds. This is about developing students. This is about making sure they're having an exceptional experience in academics, in competition, in life, um, and we're developing them. And so that's really where Jeff and I connected is that genuine care of people and relationships. And now working with him over the last several years, he's no different. I mean, who he presented that day that we interviewed him is who he's been. He's so genuine. He cares about um, not only his team, the way he treats his staff. Uh, it, it's just, it's really unique. And um, and it's always really fun to watch him. And the way that he's embraced in San Antonio and the way San Antonio has embraced him, that he, people, when you listen to him, you just gravitate and you want to run through you know a wall for him. A lot of contracts with coaches in college football seem to be written on toilet paper. What is it about this relationship that you have with Jeff that when he signed that contract, there is that actual dedication and kind of going off of that, how hard is it to keep a coach in college football these days? Oh, it, it's so difficult. Um, you know, the uh, as we went through that negotiation, again, I think Jeff really values, I, I'm really transparent. He knows what he sees is what he gets. He also knows that I let him do his job, that I hire great people and, and let them do their job. And I think he really appreciates that. We were really lucky that his wife, Carrie, loves San Antonio. Um, she's made so many friends. She's been so embraced. Um, but more than that, Jeff believes in the city. He believes in the leadership of this university. And he knows there is something so special here. And he's unlocking that through football. And so Jeff's the builder. Uh, we always talk about right now, UTSA Athletics, the university, we're hiring builders. We're hiring people who want to be innovative and people who want um, to move this forward because that's where we are in the trajectory of, of our department. And Jeff's that. Jeff's the builder. He's a legacy guy. He wants to put his footprint in something. And so I think that's really attractive to him as well. Uh, coming here from Lisa Campos, Vice President for Intercollegiate Athletics, overseeing UTSA's Roadrunners in all of their sports. And when we speak on you coming in in 2017 and it now being 2023, it's almost your six year anniversary because you came in in November. So of the hirings that you've done over a little bit more than a decade right now, what can you say about, like you said, you bring in great people and you let them lead their program. You let them put their own mark on. So you're not, you know, micromanaging them essentially what can you say about some of the people that you've brought in and you've chosen to lead and what these leaders have done as people get to know UTSA, especially coming into the American? I'd love to speak on the leadership that you brought in. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Last night we had a circles, um, a coaches circle with a lot of our supporters, an event at the zoo and in our um, we had a panel of all of our coaches and just sitting there listening to them. We all align in, again, first of all, it's about the student athletes and bringing in students who um, are great in their athletic abilities, but also are just great people. And I think that's reflective um, from our student athletes all the way to, to um, you know, our, our university president, that that's what we're about is serving students. And so when, when I hired coaches, that was number one, you know, asking a lot of questions, not about the X's and O's, but about how they develop those relationships, how they develop students. And particularly now, you know, NIL, transfer portal, all the things, all the national topics right now, it's really important. But we also have hired winners. The coaches in our program have been a part of programs that have won. They know what it looks like. They know what it feels like. They know how to lead that. And then the last ingredient, you know, is giving them support. And when you look at what we've been able to do with football and how we've increased, whether it's salaries, whether it's staff, whether it's nutrition, 
uh, we have been able to invest in a short amount of time in the football program, which has helped all of our other sports. So supporting the coaches and um, what their vision is in the in their sport is really critical. And when you talk about all of this, I look at something that you implemented called the Roadrunner Game Plan, which has three winning values that you put into it, excellence, integrity, and unity. Why choose excellence? Why choose integrity? Why choose unity? And overall call it the Roadrunner Game Plan. Yeah, that's a great question. So when I, and we're on phase two of that pro, of that um, game plan, when I came in here, we were really intentional about having a strategic plan that wasn't just going to sit on a shelf. And we involved our coaches, we involved our staff in developing this and really got feedback about what do we need to be focusing on to move this department forward. And that's why, again, this facility making improvements in our other facilities, that's why those things have actually come to fruition is because of an intentional plan. That's how we've engaged this community. And, you know, the the excellence, we, we that is our expectation that we do everything with excellence, that we don't take shortcuts, that um, our, our, we're giving excellence to our students. And the integrity, you know, people define integrity differently. Here we talk about you do what you say you're going to do. Integrity isn't, um, you know, some people define it as doing the right thing. For us, it's do what you say you're going to do and things are going to fall into place. And then, of course, unity. That This is a family. You know, all of our staff, we don't have um, a big enough department not to know each other, not to interact with each other. I meet with every one of our new staff that we um, bring in uh, for 15, 20 minutes just to get to know who they are. And that's what we want to be known for. You know, you, you always think about what's unique about um, departments and we can talk, you know, departments can talk about being a family, but here we truly are intentional about how we um, become a family and how we work with each other and how we support each other. So those are, are really important to us. And, you know, our, that road runner game plan has an aspirational vision. It has our mission and we talk about that every department-wide meeting. You know, I call on our staff to, to remind us. We bring students into our department meetings to remind us that's who we're serving and that's what's driving us every day. You know, in, in your passion that you've had, we've talked about a lot of different things and a Hispanic background, which is something that I proudly, you know, wear on my chest as well. There's something to be said about one of the pieces of this, well, a couple a couple different pieces, and that's, you know, something that people might not know the terminology of is an HSI, a Hispanic serving institution. And I would love for you to impart some knowledge and wisdom on exactly what an HSI is and why, you know, being Hispanic, being proud and being welcomed in that unity portion of it is is such an integral part of UTSA. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I share this with our student athletes and with coaches and, and you know, our community that when you look at the trajectory of my career, it hasn't necessarily been about the athletics program, um, the student affairs program. It's really been about the entire institution. And I started at UTEP, which is also a Hispanic serving institution. You know, I want to be at schools where the students look like me, that I can be a role model um, to those students. I then went to Northern Arizona University, which has a, a um, branch campus that was an emerging S HSI that also NAU is very much into about serving Native American students. And then now the opportunity to be at another HSI at UTSA. And it, it matters to me that, you know, my values align with the institution and to be able to be in front of um, our students, not just our student athletes, but our overall student population. And to tell that, you know, anything's possible and, and look at a kid who grew up in Southeast Colorado in a blue collar community, um, every statistic says I shouldn't be here, not only with a doctorate degree, um, let alone a, a Latina uh, athletic director at a Division One program. So that's the message. I actually had a chance to talk to a bunch of uh, ninth graders um, last week, and that message was so clear. And and for them to see someone who looks like them, who's been able to to accomplish the things I've been. But it hasn't happened alone. And it's those HSIs. You know, I talk about Colorado State University, my alma mater, even though it wasn't an HSI, the support they gave to first generation college students was ahead of their time. Yeah. And we I give back in a lot of different ways. But that's my message is you don't do it alone. And there's so many people who have helped um, help me throughout this whole career. 
And Lisa, how do we balance? Because we live in a world, I should say we live in a country that's very divisive. And every day it divides again and again and again. And, you know, I'm, I'm proud of my heritage. Anybody that knows me knows I'm proud to be Italian. I'm proud to be Hispanic. I talk about it daily. I love the food. I love the music. I love to live in the culture and be proud of that culture. And also, you know, be proud to be an American and be here in America. So as we have pride for who we are and at the same time welcome other people's difference, how do you balance the, okay, we're proud to to be an HSI, we're proud to, you know, honor the Hispanic heritage, and at the same time, we're proud to have everybody, because I feel like in the world we live in today, people are kind of in their own groups and in their own sectors, but as proud as they are of themselves, they're not really sharing that and having pride for other people where I live in a world where I say, hey, I'm proud to be Italian and Hispanic. And at the same time, I'm so proud to learn. How do we balance our pride with the willingness to learn? That's such a great question. And it's a million dollar question, right? But at the end of the day, it comes down to sharing our stories. And you hope that um, people, you know, once you start laying back the, the, the layers that all of us have a story and you think about my story, I mean, a rural kid, that's a story in itself, growing up in rural America, right? Being a first generation college kid, that's a story in itself. Being a female, that's a story in itself. My mom, you know, being from Mexico, having a second grade education. So all of us, all of us have such great backgrounds and stories and we all can learn from one another. And if we could pause and take time to be curious about each other, and to ask those questions and get to know each other. And we can disagree about a lot of things, but when at the heart of it, when you understand where people are coming from, how their backgrounds influenced um, their upbringing and, and their paths, I think it just opens up a lot of our, um, again, our curiosity and, and how we interact with each other. Yeah, that coming here from Lisa Campos, the VP of Intercollegiate Athletics at UTSA. You sh you said something about mom here, so I want to shout out mom. So let everybody know who doesn't know mom's first name, as well as the greatest piece of advice that mom has given to you. Oh my goodness, that's a tough one. So mom, um, Rosarda, we call her Rose Campos, because no one could ever pronounce Rosarda. Um, but oh my gosh, she gave me so much advice. But I think what I learned most from her was strength and perseverance that her upbringing, her background, she never gave up. And she gave so much to, to my sister and I. And just by example, she showed us strength and perseverance and that you just put your head down and, and work really hard um, for what you want. And when you see that strength and perseverance, when I say Hispanic female athletic director or VP of intercollegiate athletics, that's not something that you hear a lot. It's not something that's typically spoken about. There has been work over the years, over the decades for women who, and I'm all about, I don't care what you look like. I don't care what your sexuality is or whatever it may be, gender. At the end of the day, who you are as a human being, who you've chosen to be, if you are worthy of that job, which means if you've done the work and and you have, you know, you have the traits to go and take it, then you should have the opportunity to have it. I'm not for handing it out to people because of certain things or to pander to certain things. I believe that opportunities should come to those that have earned those opportunities. When we talk about Hispanic athletic directors, VP of intercollegiate athletics, we don't hear that that much. When you when we talk about females in that role in the world of sports, we don't hear it that much. I've had the opportunity to speak with you as well as many female commissioners and, you know, VP of intercollegiate athletics, working in the world commissioner, AD and whatnot. When I have the opportunity to sit and have those conversations, I find such beauty in the fact that, especially in the commissioner world, that I'm talking to these leaders of an entire conference that, you know, are in a position, in a role that was not allowed to them in the past. So do you carry that badge and do you carry it in, in a happy and fruitful and pay it forward kind of way every day to say, when we say Hispanic female leading a department of athletics, that's, that's such a rarity. 
It really is. And and I do uh, carry a badge with that. And there's also additional pressure, right? That you want to be the example and, and um, you want to do it the right way. And I'm so fortunate that I have such a, a great group of supporters in, in the athletics world, in the student affairs world, that um, when when you need support, they're there for you. And but it is um, it is a badge of honor. And like I said, hopefully it is a role model for the ninth graders that I went and spoke to the other day or the kindergartners that I spoke to a couple weeks ago that they they see it. We know the research shows that when you see someone who looks like you in those positions, you can dream it and you can be it. Who did you have that you looked up to that made you believe that you could be where you are today? Was was there a mentor or a role model or someone that stuck out to you? Because like you say, if you see someone in that role, it makes you believe you can get there. You know, you grow up in, I mean, my my thing as a kid, I saw Peter Parker as Spider-Man. So I thought I could do the same thing. That was my hero growing up. So do you have that, you know, somebody that just you looked up to and said, hey, if they can do it, I can do it. Yeah, that's a great question. So of course, you know, again, I got strength and inspiration from my mom throughout my undergraduate career. I mean, I could list a whole list of folks that took a chance on me, right? That they, here's a kid who came from rural uh, Colorado and and they took a chance and admitted me at Colorado State. And um, even though it's a state institution, that's, um, you know, they, they got me through, um, four years of undergrad. And um, so I'm so thankful to all those folks and got me into, you know, grad school program. And, um, but along the way, it was just these different mentors who opened up my doors and, uh, or opened up my eyes to, to, to careers in higher ed. And no, never did I aspire to be an athletic director. I didn't even know that was a position. And Stephanie Rump, who's now the athletic director at, at um, Nevada Reno, uh, we were running buddies and she presented that opportunity and the athletic director at the time, Bob Stoll, who's being inducted in the UTEP Hall of Fame. Um, you know, he's former football coach, um, athletic director at UTEP. He took a chance on me. And I always been, you know, and when I say that, he knew I had incredible relationships on campus. I was doing student affairs work. Um, he knew I was a hard worker. I had a, a strong work ethic and he knew I could could do the job. And so those are just, you know, examples of folks who help open doors for me um, and gave me opportunity. I said that my childhood superhero was Spider-Man. Did you have one? Oh, you know what? It's so funny. I think back, I don't know. I know we owned a TV. We just did not watch a lot of TV. <laughs> and I really, I would tell you, I, I joke about, we never had Barbie dolls. We didn't have, you know, any of that stuff. So I really didn't have a, a childhood hero growing up. So who would you say is your hero today? Oh, great question. Um, definitely my parents. I mean, I just go back to family and, to, and parents. And of course, all the, like I said, all the folks who've given me opportunity, Dr. Hager, who hired me at, at NAU, who gave me that first shot to be an athletic director, Dr. Amy here at UTSA, uh, but at the end of the day, I mean, as you can probably tell, family is so important to me, and what my parents did for me growing up and what they gave me, not in monetary or materialistic things, but just in life lessons, is who I will always aspire to be. And that right there, I mean, you can't, you can't ask for better. I don't think your parents can ask for a better answer than that. You know, I, 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 I see how my parents are. And, and when you have, when you have parents that number one, show up and, and are there and help you, and they might have different personalities. My mom, and my dad have totally different personalities, but it's that love. I mean, my, my dad is out on a cruise and we haven't been able to talk for a few days. And he, he called me up and, and I called him back because he called me during my show and and so when he had called me i called him right i called him right back after the show and i said i miss you dad and he paused and he goes i miss you too wow. and he's and he was like if you don't worry he's like before you know it i'm gonna be home and i'm i'm 37 years old and i i miss going to dinner with my dad which i do all the time but not being able to do it this week i, I miss it and so when i hear you talk about your parents in such a way and I hear that that love 
And when I ask you all of these things that helped you to become who you are today, you keep going back to them. I don't think there's a greater honor as a parent than to have their child say, well, my heroes are my parents. The people who taught me are my parents. The people who let me believe, made me believe that I could are my parents. I, you know, what else do you need if that's what you have is I guess what I'm saying. Absolutely. And and it's funny that you say it. My parents both too have very different personalities. Uh, my mom was definitely the authority, authoritative one and the disciplinarian and me and my dad were, we, we joked that we sort of kept things away from her when I was getting in trouble so that my dad <laughs> didn't have to get in trouble at the same time. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, and I totally, I could totally understand that in the difference of personality, Lisa Campos here with me this morning on wake up call with Dan Tortora, as we celebrate UTSA and all that you, the university of Texas, San Antonio road run, runners are and working to become as the VP for intercollegiate athletics at UTSA. So as we look at the sports, it'll be jumping off into the American from conference USA on the men's side, baseball, basketball, cross country, football, golf, tennis, and track and field. On the women's side, basketball, cross country, golf, soccer, softball, tennis, track and field, and volleyball. When I name off these sports for men's and women's athletics at UTSA as a collective, what do the Roadrunners feel like to you? And what's a good way to describe them? Yeah, uh, You know what? We're on an upward trajectory and we have um, coaches that just know how to get it done. And we're just, I think that our entire department, our entire community is just super excited about this transition. Um, they believe in it. They're supporting it. You know, when you, when you live in the seventh largest city in the nation and both the mayor's office and the mayor there and the county office and the judge both hold press conferences to declare it. Let's go to an O UTSA day for athletics that we mean something to this community. And so it's just, I can't describe how um, excited everyone is in the community and the department. Last night, I think the coaches said it best that they're feeding off one another. The student athletes are feeding off of one another with the excitement, the momentum, the winning, the coaches, you know, great competition amongst themselves. And we just have a group. I know it, you know, it may sound cliche, but it is really family. And when we are all in one building together and our football coaches are interacting with our golf coaches and, and you have a personality like Jeff who will actually interact with all of our department, um, it, it's just something really special. You know, and, and you don't always see that. So when you are out looking for the right coach, the right leaders to to take over a program, how do you sift through what's out there to not just find someone who's talented as a coach, but to find someone who's going to fit your family and who is going to not be a wallflower on that room when the coaches meet, but to be someone who is going to introduce themselves and to be a part of the family. Because to me, it's one thing to find a good coach. It's another thing to find someone that people want to eat dinner with. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the science of it, right? I mean, our, when we hire particularly head coaches, there is incredible background work that goes into that. And I'm really fortunate that I just in this industry, I know it's a small industry. We all know each other, but I've just been connected through, probably through NCAA work and other things with so many athletic directors who just have generally taken interest in me and, and have led me always in the right path. And so when I've called athletic directors about coaches, they will give me the nitty gritty, the truth, the good, the ugly, the bad, all of it. And that's what it takes. I mean, you have got to work those phones, um, or at least that's my philosophy and, and just calling. And what, what coaches, I always give the example, I was hiring a head coach of one sport and I knew where he was coming from. And I knew the soccer coach at, at that school and those two sports may, may not have interacted, but I called that soccer coach and said, tell me about this guy. Tell me about how he, he, how he, act and he said Lisa he will come when we win games he's coming down to our hallway and congratulating us and he doesn't have to do that and that when nobody's looking yeah. is what matters and when um coaches who have nothing or references that have nothing to lose who will give me the real you know day-to-day -day, um check in on on what those um, candidates look like is really important so I tell that to our assistant coaches all the time. You know, they're they're aspiring to be head coaches. 
And I tell them, listen, the world is small and how you treat people around here, how you interact with the department, how you lead in this department, someone will call me and ask me that. And so you're always on um, and true, authentic people. I think that they shine. And and so it, to answer your question, it's a lot of reference checking. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I, I've lived in, in the sports world for almost 20 years, which is insane to think of. And being a part of this, I have realized that you could be the nicest person, kindest person, most honest person and do your job well. And there still may be people that don't like you, right? There still may be people that have been on your show 20 times and you call them for number 21 and you don't get a phone call back. How do you deal with the reality that as good as you try to be, and as you said, you're on all the time, that when you do the right things and you feel like you put your best foot forward and you're honest and you have integrity and you build good relationships, when some relationships end abruptly without reason, how have you learned to navigate forward? Because I think that's one of the toughest tests in and out of sports is when you feel like you're leading with all the right reasons and doing everything you can and yet sometimes roads become dead ends that you thought you could drive on forever. Yeah. You know, I, I think my philosophy on that is really no one should ever be surprised when that road ends at a particular school. Like I hope that we have such honest, authentic conversations that we give feedback. One of the things that I do is um, I will meet with every head coach. We're on a, uh, on a cadence and it's just, it can be 15 minutes. It can be an hour that we're just checking in and, um, they're giving me feedback about the department. I'm giving them feedback about uh, what I'm seeing in their program. And so I just don't think anyone should ever be surprised um, if that relationship had to end or whatever that might look like that um, hopefully we are always helping each other get better. Um, and we're always giving feedback and giving opportunity to allow people to, to um, reach that, that potential and if they're just not that, that they should have gotten so much feedback that they understood what was going to happen. Lisa Campos here with me this morning on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora inside of the Cafe Kubal Studios. UTSA is moving forward into the American. We talk about preparation. You spoke about a strategic plan. It is not just a binder that sits on a shelf. And you had mentioned that we don't want to build something here that we just Put away on the shelf and it collects dust how long ago were you at utsa building a strategic plan if and when a conference came calling when did this start for you truly yeah it started really day one i got on i got hired in november december of 17 i got onto campus january of 2018 I got, you know, we we restructured some things. And as soon as um, the team was put together, we went to work right away and started putting this plan together. And like I said, we've done a refresh. We've done um, Roadrunner Game Plan number two that we're working on right now. Um, but it was immediate because we knew that, again, we are always wanting to position ourselves um, to put our best foot forward. And uh, again, what's so great about UTSA, there's a ton of opportunity yeah. Um, whether again, it's in facilities and infrastructure, there's a lot to do in other words. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's just prioritizing what is going to move us forward in the, in the way that we want to. So when you're putting this plan together to be prepared for, cause I've seen other colleges and universities say, Hey, we want to be ready if, and when somebody calls us, it doesn't mean we'll go, but we want to be ready in this world of reclassification and realignment. We want to know that all of our ducks in a row so we can either say yes or no instead of somebody coming to us and saying, we want you and us saying we're not prepared. So what goes into the strategic plan of UTSA being prepared when the American called? Yeah, you know what? It, it, it was a, um, we really needed to get feedback from our students, from our coaches. I think that first, I don't know, however many months was really a list, listening session about what do we do well and, and where would we need to improve? And no surprise, facilities was really the number one thing for our coaches. And that became one of our biggest, um, highest priorities. And then again, infrastructure, but it was about putting our the right team together, listening to the coaches and the student athletes about what was missing in this department. And then it was a, a working a ton, of course, with our provost, um, SB, 
Um, on the academic side, our CFO, Dr. Um, uh, Veronica Salazar, who, you know, having a relationship with the CFO is very important um, and finding those resources. And then, and then putting together infrastructure on our development side in conjunction with our foundation for the resources, because all of these things that we talked about take resources and we could dream and, and plan, but without the resources, you can't move forward. So that was a really key ingredient in finding those key resources, prioritizing what UTSA athletics needed at the time and moving forward with those initiatives. And let me tell you, we still have a ton of work ahead of us. So that, that was, that was one of my next points here is what, are the next pieces on this this honey do list of UTSA? What's on the list? Yeah, and and to back up a little bit, to, to really think about and be proud of what we've done, we had such momentum, and then COVID hit. Yeah, and then you think about how that impacted everybody, how it impacted our resources, and uh, but well, I'm just really proud we've continued to get out of that, to build our budgets back up, to have the success that we're having. Um, but the the list ahead of us continues to be infrastructure. It continues to be, you know, um, what is important to the student athletes. It's going to be um, the the nutrition, the training table, um, those practical things. What's important to the coaches? It's recruiting. It's travel. Going into the American, like those things are going to be really important to to our coaches and for our staff. I mean, there's, um, you know, for our development staff, it's it's finding, again, those additional resources for our video staff. It's, we're going to have a higher level of expectation for production. So a ton of money right now is being invested into our, our TV production for ESPN and, and for that contract with the American. Um, so a, a lot, you know, staff infrastructure, and then of course facilities, and that's going to continue to be a huge priority. Um, like I mentioned, we're fundraising currently for our um, basketball and volleyball practice facility. We're doing, we've done some minor upgrades to softball, baseball, but those two facilities have to have major upgrades. What Coach Hallmark is doing right now to be in top 25 is amazing. And it's a testament to him and his coaching staff, um, but we need to do some upgrades there. So a whole list of things, um, figuring out the NIL part of this. Um, so lots ahead of us, lots to think about. And um, and then a lot for our fundraisers to find those resources for us to get this all done. And you you spoke on infrastructure and it's something that we hear a lot when it comes to politics. People always say infrastructure. And then, and I've asked people kind of like when when you're watching the political side of things, like, what do you think that means? And people are like, I don't know. And so, so <laughs> for you, what is UTSA when we talk infrastructure with the University of Texas San Antonio? What are we focusing on? Yeah, infrastructure for me is really the staff. Um, it's the the internal operations that's making sure number one, we have the right people in the right seat in the bus. It's making sure our staffing levels are helping us be successful. And so we have a whole list of positions that we still want, need. Um, you know, the coaches, of course, have um, a, a list of those positions and um, things that are going to help us. But, you know, for the, our, just to give you an example, when I first got here, um, we had no relationship with our sister institution, UT Health. They are basically a medical school. And it made sense to me that UT Health and UTSA Athletics have a strong um, relationship. And we've been able to do that. And, you know, for the first time ever, a couple of years ago, um, we were able to get a full-time position for our student athletes. We had never had that before. Um, we have a physical therapist, um, athletic trainer now that's full-time for our student athletes. We now have nutrition station for our student athletes. So those were some of the infrastructure things that um, we didn't have with our relationship with UT Health. We now have mental health services. And so those things that our student athletes really need to be successful, you look back um, pre-COVID, we did not have those things and we're building at. And again, partnerships with sister institutions like that, thinking in that way is helping us get these things done. And, and Lisa, you spoke a little bit, you brought up NIL and the transfer portal. I have talked about this many times and it's funny to me, I was listening to a show on Sirius XM when I was driving uh, last year, and they said, who knew 
like, yeah, okay, we thought maybe it could be a little out of hand, but who thought it would be this out of hand? And while I was driving, I went, <laughs> I think I think I said it in 2020, go check the tape, because you can't have you can't have nothing to everything and no parameters. You can't earn any money. You can't get four hundred dollars for the YMCA. Now you can make a ten million dollar contract. So the transfer portal has essentially become free agency. And NIL was not supposed to be used to lure a student athlete from one school to another. However, it has been. And we're hearing of this. Well, they offered me 400000 They offered me 800000 I went there. How do we get any sort of control over this? I think calling it Pandora's box would be an understatement. So what do we do now that this has been out for a couple of years and there's been little to no control, little to no direction, not a lot of rules, not a lot of regulations, and people just kind of doing things until they get caught or until they get yelled at. So what are we doing with NIL and the transfer portal? Yeah, isn't it amazing that NIL really hasn't been along for, you know, maybe a year, year and a half, and it feels like it's been here. It's like been <laughs> such a topic of conversation. Um, it is, you know, when I think coaches understood that there was going to be a connection with recruitment uh, maybe administrators didn't catch on on that, that, you know, the purity of what NIL should be was the focus, right? Um, and unfortunately, it has turned into something that it shouldn't be. And it's going to take, you know, a standard. Um, and, and that may not even ha- help it, right? That they're, the collectives are going to continue doing what they're doing, um, the standardization might help um, or should help some level setting of, of this um, NIL if we could get back to because at the at the beginning or at the end of the day, I should say that NIL, if it if we use it as it should be, is really the right thing for student athletes. You think about the student athletes that were um, being penalized because they were an athlete for not being able to, you know, they couldn't use their name, image, and likeness. That was the true intent. And it's just really unfortunate. It got it used in a, in a sense that it shouldn't have and in a way it shouldn't have. And I don't have the million dollar solution for how we're going to reel that back, that it's not connected with recruitment because that was never the intent um, that we got to figure out is how you separate the recruitment from um, the NIL and let it get back to what it originally was going to be. Lisa Compost, VP for Intercollegiate Athletics, overseeing UTSA's Roadrunners. What have been your discussions with the student athletes and the coaches? Do you hold open forums? And is there a message from you about NIL and the transfer portal that you have sought to not only bring forward initially, but that you kind of revisit with the student athletes and the coaches? Yeah, you know what, for us, uh, yeah, constant conversations with our student athletes, getting their feedback, uh, understanding more. Um, And really, our student athletes have used it in a way that it was intended. And there's um, we, we, we're not getting these multi-million dollar recruiting, Mm -hmm. um, connections, but, um, our students are really the ones who are using it in the way that it was intended really have had great experience with it. Um, we've had a community that has, uh, supported particularly our local students, um, you know, whether it's car dealerships or, or other small businesses, who have really gravitated to these local students who our community is familiar with because they've watched them from junior high, high school, now now at UTSA. Um, but it is, you know, the and then when you talk about the transfer portal, I think our coaches have done a, a really great job. When you look at Jeff's transfer portal, and I don't want to jinx it because I know it's open right now, those student athletes want to stay and play for him. Yeah. And I think that's true for for many of our coaches that he's created such a culture. San Antonio is an incredible place to be. UTSA is an up and coming institution that's done some incredible things that our students feel really good about being here. And so the transfer portal really hasn't been an issue for football. Um, I think when you have a, a basketball season that we did, that that makes sense that they're wanting to go to more successful programs and. 
Um, so we've had some uh, transfer portals, you know, some transfers in uh, men's basketball. But for the most part, I think it comes down to playing time for student athletes that if they see I've been out recruited, I'm not going to play, playing is important, let me transfer. That's what we've really seen here. It hasn't been about um, the culture of our department or the culture of our sport, sport programs. And again, when you look at Jeff's track record, um, students want to stay and play for him. Yeah. And that, you know, obviously you hope that that wins out. You hope that personal relationships, honest, good connections are what wins out here. And I'm a firm believer that it's what's won out and why I am where I am right now in my life today. Lisa Campos here with us. We have two final pieces. The last one, rapid fire. You and I get to get away from sports and put each other on the hot seat and have some fun with that. So we're about to do something, hopefully show another side to Lisa, to many of you that know her. But before we go there, we got a couple months until the official start date of UTSA in the American Athletic Conference. What are you focusing in and zeroing in on between now and July 1st of 2023? Yeah, so finishing out the season strong right now in Conference USA is, is a focus with our spring sports, but then on a practical level, I mean, again, making those investments in the production, just some of the, the practical things about changing out logos and in, in our facilities and on our uniforms, um, and then having a celebration in July and and um, celebrating this, this new era and uh, what things are going to look like in the future. How do you leave Conference USA? What has that been like with their leadership? Yeah, you know what? So I've been a member of Conference USA even in my days at, at UTEP, and I have a lot of respect for um, Judy and her staff, Keisha, you know, everyone who's been there. I've known them for 20 years. And um, so for, on a, you know, and it goes back to what we talk about, that when you know people on a personal level and you know their journeys, um, that makes it tough to to not be a part of that anymore and to say goodbye um, uh, from that personal level, but from the business level, of course, this is just the right thing to do for the university and the athletics program. Um, but, but have a lot of respect for CSA and, and for that leadership. It's now time for rapid fire. So Lisa Campos joining me here on wake up call with Dan Tortora inside of the cafe Kubal studios. We get three questions a piece. It could be about anything. These are not pre-planned or pre pre prepared. I should say, if that's even a word of pre prepared, but we're going to have this rapid fire. Lisa, you get to start with asking me the first question. Oh, goodness. Okay. Um, and it could be anything. Wow. Um, <laughs> let me see. This is, I, I was not prepared for this. Uh, where, where did, where were you born? I was born in Syracuse, New York. Right. And right in the, the heart of the state to people that know very little about New York there's a giant, massive, gaping area of land that's not this tiny little island. And so I live on that giant part of the land that's not there. <laughs> and uh, and so, yeah, I, I love my hometown. I came back here and had the opportunity to uh, see my grandmothers before they passed away for a few years, uh, take care of and live with my grandmother, my G-mama, my mom's mom, and got to see her at almost 101. And yeah, I built my business here. I have the beauty of of living in this world of I'm in my hometown. I got to put my name on the door. I, I truly believe the Macklemore line where he said, I have my city right behind me. If I fall, they got me. And so I get to build my brand in Syracuse, but I get to travel all over the world and build my brand all over this country and beyond that. So I have this healthy balance of being in my home but then getting to see the world. And, and I don't know how you beat that. I really don't. That's awesome. That's really neat. All right, Lisa. Hmm. If you had to write a new cartoon starring the UTSA Roadrunner, what would be the mission of the Roadrunner in the cartoon? And who would be the villain? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> The mission of the roadrunner in the cartoon um, would be to, I, I mean, roadrunners are fierce. Like I said, if you've ever seen, go on a YouTube video, watch how roadrunners destroy rattlesnakes, how they destroy. I mean, it's, it's kind of creepy, but so our mission would be to be fierce um, when 
ton of championships um, and represent our our village, our community well. And the villain, man, going into the new conference, I'm not sure sure who our villain's going to be, but it might be, um, you know, a a bird up north, um, in Denton. <laughs> okay, all right, <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. So something that will travel with you from CUSA. <laughs> What's your next question for me? Um, favorite favorite genre of music. Oh, well, so there's three, eh, there's, well, I guess there's four. So classic rock, hip hop, R&B, country. I like them all. Now, I, what I'll do is I'll give you who, if I could work with, because I've actually done music my whole life. And a lot of people don't know that because they know me for this, but I've been singing since I was three. Oh, wow. So if I worked with, if I worked in the classic rock world, I'd want to work with Bon Jovi. I'd want to do some work with Phil Collins. If I worked in hip hop, I would want to work with Mace, one of my favorite rappers growing up. And if I worked in R&B, I would want to work with Boys to Men. <laughs> and then, yeah, there's there's a bunch in R&B, but I'll say Boys to Men is my favorite. And if I worked in country... I would probably want to work with hmm, Rascal Flats, Brooks and Dunn, and Carrie Underwood. Ah, you got to get some George Strait in there. Come on, we're in, in <laughs> Texas, San Antonio. <laughs> I know. And the, and the thing is, is that a lot of the country, since it's been more new over the last few years, is that I'll listen to a bunch of George Strait songs, but I won't know that it's him. So somebody will say to me, oh, do you like George Strait? And I'm like, I don't know. And they'll go, well, what about this, this, this? And I'm like, yeah, I listen to like 17 of his songs. <laughs> so that's kind of how I got in. I got into it by just listening to songs. And Rascal Flatts was at the beginning of it. But I have met Carrie Underwood, gotten to speak to her, got to have like a human, normal conversation with her, which was really nice. And so she's definitely one of my favorites. I also know to never break up with a girl like her because of what she does to people <laughs> stars in those songs. But, uh, <laughs> but Brooks and Dunn, there's a song that I get emotional with every time. I don't think I could sing it without crying. And, and, and it's, it's, it's the song where they talk about, uh, you know, we're trying to remember the chorus right now. I believe is the song. Because I always remember I raised my hands, bow my head. I always remember that part of it and finding more truth than the words written and written and read. And the way he talks about being a kid and going to his neighbor's house and then getting the phone call in college that that neighbor had passed away. Mm. And old man Wrigley has died. I, you know, just hearing that line. So it's it's just such a human, beautiful, godly, compassionate song. And it gets me every time. So... I would definitely have to work with Brooks and Dunn. Uh, that's nice. so, okay. All right. So if you could, if you could put together a singing group of five people in the sports world, and you're one of them, <laughs> who would be in your band? We're making the band Lisa Compo style. Who are the four people from the sports world that you make your band with? Oh my goodness. <laughs> so that's a, this is a good one. <clears throat> I gotta I gotta really think this one through. In the sports world, professional, collegiate, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um this act this one actually may not be popular right now in San Antonio, but of course, Coach Pop. Um, I, he's just incredible and, in, and in the things that he's done. So I'd have coach pop. I'm not sure what instrument he would play. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and then keeping it CSU and San Antonio, uh, Becky Hammond. Okay. So people, um, well, people wouldn't know this. So I, w I actually went to CSU when Becky Hammond was, um, playing basketball at, at Colorado state university and, I probably went to every one of her basketball games. She had no idea who I was, but just watching that four years of 
what that women's basketball team was able to do was unbelievable. Yeah. Um, so that, that was a lot of fun. And then I followed her career. And then ironically, we both ended up here in San Antonio, which is pretty neat. And then I finally got to meet her. Um, I got to go old school, Michael Jordan. Okay. Um, he, he's going to keep us on track and <laughs> competitive in the band world. I don't know what, <laughs> what he would play, but yeah. He's got the um, style for it. He's got the style. Definitely. Yes, he does. Okay. Um, am I, where am I at? I so got one got, more. You got what you see. So you got pop Becky Jordan. You, you got one more. I got one more, man. I'm going to go with, um, I'm not going to say his name, right, but it's my, one of my son's favorite baseball players for the, Angels, um, Oshotani, Oshotani, Oshotani. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, okay, I'm gonna go with him to just right. make an international player and to make my eight year old son happy that I picked a baseball player <laughs> and a world baseball classic champion. So that's Shohei right. Otani. So I like that. Okay, that's that's good. I've never had a collected group, and it that's a nice group. I've never done a, <laughs> I've never had a, I've never asked a question in almost 20 years of making the band so you're the first time that I've <laughs> that's a hard one <laughs> what's your last one? one mine's easy um oh my gosh what was it beach or mountains oh wow beach or mountains I I love them both I I guess if I had to choose choose okay so these are weird choices if if I well not weird but they're just totally different. If I chose a beach, it would be St. Pete's Beach in down by Tampa in Florida, my favorite beach in the world so far. If it was Mount if if it was a mountain, Mount Everest, because I don't want to climb a mountain. I want to climb the mountain. The mountain. So, there you go. and I want to know if there's actually a Yeti up there. So, <laughs> <laughs> worth a shot, right? I actually know some people that believe in Bigfoot, and it it saddens me the reasons why and to the degree in which they do <laughs> believe in what you want to believe. But <laughs> when you really have a deep conversation with somebody that watches mountain monsters and they think that that's a real show, it makes me, it makes me sad. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, my question is who are you hanging out with? <laughs> not anymore <laughs> so, i told my buddy i'm like i should have just called you up and been like hey person believes a bigfoot and he would be like this so i have a friend isaac we're very close we're like brothers and so he'll tell me in any situation how to get out of it he'll say one thing to me so i'll call him up and i'll say isaac this is the situation and he'll pause and he'll go run <laughs> so, <laughs> good yeah. advice good friend so, that was a run situation my last one, since we're laughing, is on the lines of that. If you could hire a comedian to follow you around for a year and make you laugh, what comedian would you pick? Oh, okay. my gosh. That one is really hard, too. Oh, my gosh. You know, it's so funny. I was just watching. Um, so this is going to be top of mind. I think George Lopez. <laughs> I know. I I. I was just re-watching some of his videos and yeah. it was one of those days I just needed a laugh and I know that people might not laugh at what he at his jokes anymore, but I do. They're growing up in a Mexican family that those would I can relate. So I'm gonna go with George Lopez. And what I don't understand and, and you can hopefully appreciate this. My mom is not the Hispanic side. My dad's Hispanic and Italian. My mom's Italian, but she's the one that when he when he does it, why are you crying? When he does that entire <laughs> thing, that that is my mom. The whole like, the whole like I'm going to the bathroom as a kid and she's leaving, you know, and it's like wait, it's like that. That is my mother. My, I said to my mom, I called her up one day. I go, are you sure you're not Mexican? I was like, are you positive? Because Italian and Mexican is like the same mom. The whole like bring you to the dressing room to hit you, but she didn't She didn't buy anything. Like all, all of those. I was like, mom, you are, I don't know. George, George and I have the same mother, but we have different uh, cultures of mom. I don't know how it happened, but I just watched Why You Crying recently. And so, and I do that all the time. And I always, we, well, and it's funny because I bring up Isaac 
because because you know he watched it too and we'll always do the you know the jack of the box fuck the jack in the box can I have you <laughs> and and all of the the whole like do you want some french fries like my friends are fine all of that and then it's like say que any queso is it what say any queso okay. I say do you want a shave <laughs> so, that whole, that's good that whole why you cry you know what I mean why you cry <laughs> so, oh I love it yeah. I think in my house it was oh no we're not going to the doctor they'll find something wrong with you <laughs> <laughs> well and the thing is it's crazy is my grandmother on my dad's side that is Hispanic my bless her heart in heaven whenever I told her I didn't feel good and, and I was sleeping over her house she put Vicks on my chest <laughs> <laughs> and to this day I have a thing of Vicks oh, next to my too. bed. That's and when I'm not feeling good, I don't know why, but I rub it here, I put it on my uh-huh. neck, and I put it underneath my yep. nose, and I you always should, feel better. You learned right. You <laughs> learned right. <laughs> and I just, it's, like, it's like, hey, the dog's not feeling good. Put Vicks. Come up with Vicks. <laughs> Vicks. Vicks cures all. <laughs> it always works. So, uh, but yeah. So I, 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 was, I was secretly hoping you said George Lopez so I would have an excuse to use <laughs> all of this because I just watched it again recently. And I, <laughs> but... And I got to see him live. He came to Syracuse. Oh, how fun. Yeah. I think he was here in San Antonio. And I don't think I've ever, I have not seen him live. I gotta get that my bucket this, list. So there's a new movie coming out in August. And I knew nothing about the character. And now that I've gotten to know it a little bit, I'm really excited about this character. And I bought up some stuff. They're making the Blue Beetle movie for DC. And George Lopez is in the movie as a member <laughs> of the of 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 Jaime's family and I can't wait and and the funny thing is if people don't know his comedy they don't get it but when this thing attacks Jaime's face he he George screams out it's nice but he's done that in comedy before when he screams it's on your face so like I was like if you know George you're watching him going like yeah I heard that before but Uh, I've seen like all of his shows I, I, I would sit I would sit up and watch Nick at night Late at night, George Lopez, and yeah. I still go back and quote and remember pieces of that sitcom that hasn't been on in years. Yeah. Oh, it's the best. <laughs> so, that, that's a perfect way to end this. Is with that George is. Lopez. Oh, you got me laughing. I'm gonna have to pull some things up tonight. <laughs> so I know I'm gonna go back and watch Why You Cry. I'm gonna have my mom watch Why You Cry because <laughs> she'll sit there and she'll go, "I never hit you." And I'm, I'm Why are like, you crying? <laughs> Yeah, my mom will say, I never did any of that stuff. And then she'll right. laugh. She'll go and she'll laugh. And she'll go, oh, it was only one time. Or she'll say, you deserved it. That's what she'll uh, say. Love my mom. Oh my. Sweetest woman in the world. Oh, but, that's so, great. You know, any of us that have moms like that, we know they're sweet. And we also know that they're terrifying. We know they have the chancla for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so that being said, Lisa Campos, VP for Intercollegiate Athletics at UTSA. The Roadrunners will be in the American soon. They're finishing up in the Conference USA right now. And Lisa, every time it becomes my favorite one. And this is my favorite conversation so far. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate you.